guys, it's your girl Uche Wing Kosi, and it's True Crime Tuesday. So before we get started with today's video, please, please kindly subscribe to my channel, press that like button, and comment down below other true crime cases that you want me to cover. Also, follow me on my socials. Well, I'm only on IG, really. Um, it's ubuhe.bengosi, six eyes off to the X. So, I'm finally back. I know it's been a while. Happy New Year, everyone. It's 2021. Hopefully, it's going to be better than 2020. Um, I'm done with my exams, obviously, and I've passed the next grade. Um, I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe during these trying times. And without further ado, let us get started with today's true crime case. My lighting is not the greatest. It's actually really gloomy outside. And I usually rely on natural lighting, but I have like those, you know, those small selfie ring lights. So hopefully it's going to help. So today's true crime case is about Marlene Lindbergh. So who is Marlene? Marlene Lindbergh was born on the 13th of October, 1955. So we're going all the way back. Nothing, not much is said about her childhood, but from what I've gathered, it says she was brought up in an ultra-conservative and very strict household. Her father never displayed any affection to his daughters and never allowed her to like go out like most teenagers do. However, she was a very intelligent young girl in school and because she was being kept inside the house, she was like not very socially aware she was naive and pretty innocent once she left school you could say that she lacked her father figure or like an affectionate father figure but this like plays on later on into the story in february of 1972 when she was 16 years old she got a job as a clerical assistant slash receptionist at the red cross children's hospital in ronda bosch is that how you pronounce it Cape Town. She started work in the orthopedic workshop alongside Christian van der Linde, who was the workshop's chief technicians, and Lindbergh was said to have been drawn to him immediately. Van der Linde was 45 years old, and in the beginning, they had a father-daughter relationship, but it slowly started to change, and um, in April of 1973, a year after they met, they started having an affair. Somebody erased this man. This is... Okay. Throughout the remainder of 1973, the, the two continued to meet in secret at Rondebosch, Common and Pardon, Eiland. Early in 1974, the intimacy between the two stopped as uh, Van der Linde started to suspect that they were being watched as his wife was receiving anonymous phone calls. Despite the fact that Christian van der Linde had made it very clear that he would never ever leave his wife, Lindbergh was 100% sure that van der Linde's wife, Susanna van der Linde, was an obstacle to her, to her having a more permanent relationship with Christian. In July of 1974, Lindbergh was becoming desperate and she started talking about leaving Cape Town. Christian van der Linde convinced her not to, but by September, Lindbergh was fed up and she decided to take matters into her own hands and confront Susanna. Lindbergh called and explained that she and Christian were indeed having an affair and she wanted to know what Susanna's intentions were, but Susanna hung up on her that night. Lindbergh telephoned again. Whoa, this girl. <laughs> after a few weeks and this time they set an appointment to meet early in october in bellevue lindbergh expected her and susanna to come to some form of some form of agreement concerning christian but after this uh conversation clearly that's not what happened susanna said she did not plan to divorce her husband because they had children together and she also added that she did not mind playing second fiddle as long as lindbergh also didn't mind it was obvious to Marlene Lindbergh that Susanna was willing to do anything for her husband. It was around this time Lindbergh met Martinez Charles. I don't know how to pronounce his surname. I'm just going to put it on the screen. Who had lost a leg in um, a car accident. He had come to the orthopedic workshop to get an artificial limb fitted. 
He was unemployed and his social and physical disabilities destroyed his self-esteem, making him way more vulnerable to Lindbergh's approaches. Lindbergh first contacted Martinez by letter, where she asked him to come through to the orthopedic workshop and also added that if he was smart, that he could earn extra money. When he arrived at the workshop, Lindbergh gave him one rand. First of all, that's so disrespectful. Anyway, she gave him one rand and asked him to meet her outside the Ronde Bosch Hall at 7 p.m. that night, where she gave him a bottle of gin and stated that she wanted him to kill a woman for him. Martinez declined at first, saying that he was afraid to go to jail. But after some discussion, Martinez reluctantly agreed. And several days later, he went to the address in Austin Bellevue, which Marlene had given to him. He later claimed that he wanted to warn Susanna that her life was in danger, but instead, when he walked up to the door, he asked for asked her for some money. Um, she said she didn't have one. This is Susanna. She said she didn't have any money. Um, he closed the door and he walked away. A week later, Lindberg on Lindberg and Martinez met again, and he admitted that he was too afraid to go through with the murder. Marlene then gave him a radio and promised him that if he got the job done, that she would get him an artificial limb. Martinez went to Bellevue again, but this time he just walked past the house. Lenberg sent a second letter saying that he urgently needed to get this job done, stating that he should use a knife if he had to. She got another message to him saying he should call her at work. And in that conversation, he insisted that he go through with it. He promised him a car and sex after the crime was committed. In October of 1974, Len Lenberg handed in her notice at the hospital and told Christian that she was leaving Cape Town. On the 24th of October, Lenberg collected Martinez from his house in retreat and drove him to Belleville in a car. He was armed with a hammer which he was supposed to have used to kill Susanna. Lenberg dropped him off a few blocks from their house um, and then sped off and after Susanna spotted Martinez, she immediately called the police because she had seen him in the area a few times before and like that alarmed her. The Bellevue police picked him up, took him to the police station, where he, where he was beaten up and warned to not go to that area again. When Lindbergh saw that she wasn't getting anywhere with Martinus, um, she decided to take matters into her own hands. A few days after the failed attempt, she approached Rob Newman, who was an engineering student that she knew. And she asked to borrow his pistol. When he refused, she asked again if he would be willing to kill someone for her, and he again refused. And on the 28th of October, Newman's pistol went missing, and when the police came to him, he cited Marlene Lemberg as the prime sub suspect. Well, duh, you can't... Around 8.30 in the morning, on Monday, the 4th of November, 1974, Lemberg arrived at Martinez's house. She said her car was packed and that she was on her, way to, on her way to Johannesburg and that she just needed him to accompany her to uh, the van der Linda's house in Bellevue just so that she could say goodbye. <laughs> it wasn't until Marlene handed him a pistol. This is the pistol she stole from Rob Newman, by the way. Handed him a pistol when he realized that she wasn't just going there to say goodbye. They arrived outside the house at around 9 a.m. where Susanna was alone inside. And from this point, Marlene and Martinez's accounts are different. Personally, this is a personal opinion, side notes. Personally, I would believe Martinez because, I mean, who Marlene wouldn't want to throw herself under the bus. Martinez had nothing to lose. Lindbergh claimed that uh, she got out of the car, rang the doorbell, went back into the car, and that's when Martinez went inside the house and committed the crime. Martinez maintained that they acted together, and this was further corroborated by one of the neighbors of the Van der Linders, Mrs. Marais. Oh my God. Marais? Marais. Jeez. Um, who had walked past Marlene's white Ford Anglia twice in the space of 10 to 12 minutes, and on both occasions, the car was empty. So it's either Marlene's invisible or she was inside the house. Martinez says that Lindbergh rang the doorbell, Susanna opened the door, and Martinez and Marlene both entered the house. They frightened Susanna, and she had threatened to call the police. As she attempted to get away, Lindbergh tripped her, she fell, and hit her head on the door. 
While Susanna was on the floor, Lenberg struck Susanna in the jaw with the butt of the gun. And um, by, Lenberg, by Lenberg's instruction, Martinez throttled semi-conscious Susanna van der Linde. Lenberg then gave Martinez a pair of scissors, which was on the sideboard. And Martinez said that he remembered uh, stabbing Susanna three times, but later pathologists would say that there were seven stab wounds, six of which penetrated the chest. After the murder, Lindbergh squirted green dye onto Martinez um, from a gas pistol that had belonged to Susanna von der Linde. And if you don't understand why she did that, she wanted to obviously pin Martinez um, to the murder. And obviously, if he had the dye all over him, then he was obviously there. Um, after warning Martinez that she would deny any involvement if he went to the police station, she dropped him off at home and set off for Johannesburg. When police brought Christian van der Linde home to come and identify his wife, he casually turned her body with his foot and then said, yeah, like, it is my wife. Really? This was noted by the officers that he seemed very cold and callous, um, like uh, he didn't care and like was expecting it. And uh, it was then speculated that it was Christian who had influenced Lindbergh to commit the crime or to get rid of his wife, but um, no proof was found and he was never charged or tried for any of that. Martinez kept both of the pistols that they used at the crime scene and later when he was asked by police why he didn't discard of them, he said it's dangerous to throw pistols away and it's not dangerous to kill another human being. Okay, okay. Susanna's body was found at 1 p.m. by her daughter. Um, so Christian had tried to call his wife multiple times like throughout the morning and he started getting worried because she wasn't answering So he called their daughter Zelda who worked at the Tigerberg hospital and asked if she at lunchtime could like quickly go check um, On her mom and see if anything was wrong when she arrived at the house strangely It was locked but when she looked through into the window She could see her mom's body lying on the floor the police immediately began an intensive murder investigation and their main suspect was a crippled colored man who had been seen in the area multiple times before the murders happened. It was actually, wow, this is so freaky, but it was actually because of Martinez that Susanna had insisted that her husband buy her that gas pistol. And at first, nobody even suspected Mar um, Marlene. So the next week, the police's attempt to identify um, Martinez and his whereabouts failed. But at around 7.30 on the 13th of November, a breakthrough occurred when Lieutenant Roland Fury of the Brixton Murder and Robbery Unit in Johannesburg went to see Marlene Lindbergh, who was living in her, in her uncle's house in Bryanston. He asked her to accompany him to the Brixton police station for questioning. In the car, she had admitted that indeed she was Christian's lover and that she was expecting the police to contact her immediately after she heard the news of the murders from her mom. Sure. When she was asked about her association with a colored, crippled man named Martinez, she denied it. Yuri also asked her about her request to Robert Newman to borrow his pistol and to also get rid of someone for him for her um namely susanna and she admitted that she had but like she she was joking fiori had no specific evidence to tie marlene lambert to the murders but he did note and found it weird that she was unnaturally nervous throughout the interviews while fiori was on the phone with um another cape town investigator major van asvachen he began asking her questions and she suddenly blurted out that she took martinez to the house stayed in the car while he committed the crime and then took him home. Lindberg was arrested and formally charged with the murder of Susanna van der Linde. She later made a full statement where she did admit to asking Martinez to do away with Susanna. She claimed that she waited in the car while her accomplice went into the house, committed the crime and Martinez was arrested the very next day. The trial of Marlene and Martinez began on the 5th of March, 1975 in the Cape Town Supreme Court. The trial drew hundreds of spectators who fought for, literally fought for seats in the courtroom. The hearing, which lasted seven days, during which the state called more than 30 witnesses, the judge, Justice Diamond, and his two assessors, A.J. van Niekerk, 
and F. Fanzel Smith, who deliberated overnight and returned with the verdicts of guilty for both accused. The court found no extenuating circumstances and both Lemberg and Martinez were sentenced to death. Two months later, the case was reopened for open on appeal and in July of 1975, the death sentences were set aside and Lindbergh got 20 years and um, Martinez got 15 years. Martinez was released in June of 1986 and became an evangelical preacher. Wow. Wow. While Lindbergh was paroled in December of the same year. Lindbergh ended her life in October of 2015, five days shy of her 60th birthday. So she had suffered from osteoporosis and had also been diagnosed diagnosed with breast cancer and she could not take the severe pain anymore she was in and she committed suicide alone at home. Martinez died in a car crash years later in 1992 on the N7. The third member of this tragic triangle, Christian funded Linder, died a lonely man in 1983. After the child, he moved to Krugersdorp so he, he could be closer to his wife's grave site which was in the Machalisberg mountains every day. Oh, he expressed remorse of ever meeting Marlene Lemberg, saying once to a reporter that I sincerely wish to God that I had never set my eyes on Marlene Lemberg. You shouldn't even have been looking. You were married. After the trial, a law called the Marlene Lemberg Clause was passed in South Africa, preventing criminals from profiting from their crimes. Since it was believed Lemberg planned to sell her story to the media for a large sum of money. Whew. that is the end of today's true crime story really unfortunate that susanna had to lose her life over her husband's infidelity um but um that's it for today's case don't forget to subscribe like comment share um and i'll see you guys on our next true crime tuesday bye